Hello, everyone. I'm Dwight Mitchell, the founder of Family Preservation Foundation. Welcome to another episode of our Child Protection Pro Se Help Kit. Uh, the title of this episode is Court Findings for Federal uh, 4E Funding. And I'm going to give uh, you a little background on, on the Title IV so that you understand why the children are being taken away from the parents' custody uh, immediately. Uh, I hope you enjoy the content of this series and uh, it, it better enables you to understand the process that you're involved with as it relates to CPS. Um, as, as most of you know, and for those joining us for the first time, uh, after a 22-month battle, I successfully defeated Dakota County Social Services and uh, obtained my, my children back uh, pro se. Um, it, was, it was a long, arduous battle, uh, to, to say the least. Um, it wasn't pleasant, but, but I did learn a lot. And what I'm hoping to do with these, these series is to educate you to the process of CPS while applying the state statutes and the case law to uh, allow you to become more familiar with the process so that you can defend yourself against the allegations of CPS using the tools that I use, like Google, Google Scholar and looking at the state statutes and looking at case law. Um, I need to advise you, this is my, my disclaimer that I have to put in every single video, I'm not an attorney, um, I'm not licensed to practice law, nor am I providing you legal advice. I, I, I recommend you to obtain your own attorney uh, if you have the means to do so. Uh, this, these sessions are only for educational purpose only based on what I learned. Um, and I just need you to know I'm not providing you legal services and I'm not providing you a legal strategy. Um, you are representing yourself pro se. That means boy, for yourself by, by the law so that anything that you learn, all the notes that you gleam, all the templates that we give you, you have to apply to your, your case. It's hard work. Um, nothing in this life that's worthwhile is free. And uh, please take note of this. Sorry, I have to say this at the beginning of every video, but uh, that is the law. I'm not allowed to practice law without a license, so I, I, I must say that. Um, so let, let's dive right into this episode. Uh, court findings for Title IV funding reimbursement. We, you know, we're all sitting here talking about it's for the money. You know, they're doing it for the money. They're taking our children for the money. Uh, and, and the truth of the matter is um, there is a trigger mechanism that enables the government to get reimbursed uh, for uh, putting your child in, in, in uh, out-of-home placement. Um, so what you need to know first and foremost is that the court has to order placement, permanency, or continued foster care in order for CPS to get the funding. One of the key mechanisms that, that frankly surprised me because they talk about all this reunification and all these efforts to unite the, the child with their parents and not taking the child out of the home uh, and your, your civil rights. And, and while they'll talk to all of this, it's sort of duplicitous. Or, uh, and, when I, and by that, I mean the statutes are set up that in order for the county to be reimbursed for Title IV funding, at the very first hearing, there has to be an involuntary removal, um, meaning by law enforcement or hold for immediate custody, has to be put on that child uh, in order for them to get placement. A, a secondary mechanism is voluntary. If you come in and say, I can't handle my son, or I can't handle my daughter, they won't listen to me, they won't go to school, they're out of control, you know, I, I need you to come in and provide services, CPS, and take over. That's another trigger mechanism. Um, children over 18 can re enter foster care also uh, voluntarily um, or through CPS. Here again, that's another triggering mechanism. So keep in mind when people are like, why? I don't understand. Why didn't I get a safety plan? Why didn't they leave the child at home? Why didn't they put the child with my grandmother or, or an aunt or an uncle. Well, if they do that, which is what they're supposed to do technically, 
then they don't receive their, their Title IV funding reimbursement. So that very first court order removing your child is what triggers it. So the con continuation of your child in the custody of the parent is actually contrary to, to child welfare placement in the best interest of the child. So if you go look at Minnesota statute 260C.151 subsection 6, it clearly lays this out. It has to be in the very first court order. So, you know, as you're following along in the PDF, you can go research this later on. Don't take my word for it, but it is something that you should be aware of. So the emergency protective care hearing is the very first court order that, uh, for very first court hearing that you go to. So that EPC hearing is where that judge actually will make that, that determination. So they'll review um, uh, the, the allegations, not proof now, mind you, just allegations. Allegations means if this were true, then it would be, in fact, child abuse. And that's a very low standard in, Minas in Minnesota. All they have to do is allege that you did something, and unless you have something to directly refute it, then the judge is always going to go with the allegations because unlike in other states like New Jersey where the social worker actually has to come in with proof, in Minnesota they do not. So if you look at the continued custody of the child, and that's Minnesota Statute 260C.178, Subdivision 1F, that will tell you the details. So... In the EPC, they'll say one of the following has to take place. Reasonable efforts, uh, findings that require under Minnesota Statute 260C.178. It, you know, and what it's trying to say is that the social worker made reasonable efforts to prevent the placements. Well, this means that the agency took a look and said, Yes, that's reasonable efforts. In my humble opinion, given the circumstances, I don't think the child should be at home. That's the threshold. They don't have to make a showing of proof to the court or anything of that nature for the child to be taken out. So as you're following along with this handout, I have all the state statutes in there. So please be aware that the threshold is very low so that when you do go to court, because this threshold is so low, you need to bring in something that will cancel out the allegation. When I say cancel out, it's, you know, they say uh, the mother is, 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 uh, does drugs. And that's that, say that's one example of negligence. Well, you need to come to court to that very first hearing with a drug test that proves you do not take drugs and with a hair follicle test that say you haven't taken drugs in the last 90 days, and that will cancel out the allegation. They can't say that you did something if you have, you know, tests from a doctor, you know, that you submitted to the court that you've never done drugs. So that's a way of canceling out the, the, the allegation. Um, there's also something known as a bypass, and, and, a, and a bypass is something that happens um, if you have had a CHIPS case in the past or if you have children in the care uh, of CPS at the time, say you have another child. So a lot, of, a lot of parents call me and they're like, they took my child, you know, they took my baby out of the hospital you know, right after it was born. Well, in Minnesota and in a lot of the states, it's a bypass. If you're unfit to take care of one child, then they feel that you're unfit to take care of all their children. And while that may not be the case, especially when there's a new father on the scene and, you know, that in and of itself is um, an infringement. But the reason they can get away with it is because it is a state statute, that state statute 260C.012 and state statute 260C.507B that talks about the bypass. Please read that, uh, especially if you're in that situation. A lot of parents have called me saying they're afraid, they're pregnant, you know, their baby is due. Uh, I advise all of them, if CHIPS has one of your child, children in their protective care or custody, you need to leave the state immediately. You need to go to like the Wisconsin or Arizona, New Jersey, wherever. But if that baby is born in Minnesota, Minnesota will be in the delivery room taking that child. And I, sometimes I even wonder how they even find out 
because uh, certain people will say they don't tell social services and you know social services will show up like the next day so I, I don't know if there is some alert list I don't know if the hospital has a list that I, I really haven't found out but there's been too many parents that have come to me and said that that this has happened to them so please keep in mind about the bypass case and the EPC and 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 look into to that also um, you know something else that will get you a bypass is if you have um, uh, a sexual abuse case so if you have abused a child in in the past uh, sexually then that you'll get a bypass uh, for that also where at the EPC they'll take the child right away or any additional child right away uh, if you committed uh, an offense that's um, as a predatory offender that's another example of the bypass um, if you've done assault like second or third degree like serious assault to the child like broke their arm or something of that nature that's another bypass offense so these are some of the things that will do the bypass in the EPC. Uh, something else I, I, I spoke about earlier is uh, voluntary placements. If you voluntarily place your child into uh, CHIPS uh, custody or CPS custody, uh, there's a 90-day uh, petition that, that goes into effect and a hearing 20 days after service to determine if placement is in the child's best interest again. These are not the normal circumstances. I'm mentioning this because these are the things that, that trigger the Title IV funding. Uh, so in all aspects, there's supposed to be reasonable efforts to reunify the child, the parent, or the guardian, and that's uh, Minnesota Statute 260C.141, uh, uh, subsection 2. And while that's supposed to be in place at all times, it's discretionary. So that reasonable efforts level is set by the social worker. It's actually set by the person that's taking the child away. Uh, not an independent party, which I actually think it should, but they say, well, the social worker is trained and qualified and they set those standards. Uh, irregardless of if the social worker like, just doesn't like you and they believe that 90% of the time, if they receive a call for maltreatment or something of that nature, they, you, you've actually done it and you're, you're guilty. So. They're there just trying to collect evidence the whole time. Um, so, you know, they can take the child right away, trigger the Title IV funding, and then keep receiving reimbursement from, from the uh, federal government. So, um, you know, if the child re-enters foster care after their 18th birthday, and this generally happens when a child is... Uh, uh, Men mentally challenged, that's a PC way of saying it, or they have a learning disability or something of that nature. Uh, here again, uh, it, there's a motion to reopen the, the, uh, the case by the social worker or something of that nature. That can trigger a bypass because the person was already in CPS custody, and although by 18 they're supposed to be released if CPS feels that they don't have the mental faculty to, um, to uh, live on their own, then here again, that, that bypass comes into place. Um, there are orders for hearings of permanency, including the termination of parental rights. While this whole process is going on, um, the, the, the Title IV funding is still in place. Uh, technically, the Title IV funding is not supposed to last longer than 12 months uh, from the time that it was originally court ordered. But there are exceptions to that. You can get an extension uh, if there's a petition that states a prima facie case that the agency has provided reasonable efforts to try and reunify you or active efforts in place with a case plan or it's an Indian child or, or, or something of nature and it's not working out right. That statute 260C.507 uh, section C, well then that can extend the, the Title IV funding and uh, uh, keep the child in foster care that much longer. You know, I, I, I'm here to tell everyone, which is kind of, it's kind of ironic, if it wasn't for the Title IV funding, we probably wouldn't have half the kids in foster care that are in foster care. It's only the fact that the government is paying all of this money, the federal government is paying all this money, that the states are actually 
you know, providing the service. They would like to think of themselves as, as guardian angels or protecting the innocent and the weak. And, and in some cases they are. I, I have met some fantastic social workers, but um, I, I've seen the things they've done. I've looked at too many court records. I've looked at too much evidence. Um, the structure in its current form is obsolete. It doesn't work. It's Einstein's definition of an insanity to keep doing the same thing over and over again and getting the same result. They have their own federal results. They have their own state results. Yet for the last 10 or 20 years, they, nothing has changed in the process. They've changed a few things here and there. But by and large, all of the things they've changed has, has been to benefit them and, and not the family and, and not doing services for the family and everything they can to keep that family together. And, and that's, that's my own humble opinion. I mean, someone else might have a different opinion, and I'm not, I'm not going to argue with them. I'm very data-driven, and so I've looked at all the statistics, and I have all of the federal documents and all the federal findings, and I, I, I tell everybody, I'm like, don't take my word for it. Go look at the government statistics, both state and federal. I mean, is anybody looking at their own statistics? Is anyone looking at all of the... The, the funding that's, that's going into Title IV like every single year. So, you know, you, you, when you're spending $29 billion a year, uh, you know, and you're not getting any results, anything, anything else would be out of business but the government if you're spending $29 billion a year and the trend is going down in, in, instead of up. So um, when you go through your admit-deny hearing or your trial for permanency, um, you still will have to do all that again if, if, if there is a bypass case. Um, it, so you now we're past that year threshold that I talked about that the Title IV can extend to. And some people will think, well, you know, they'll give the child back, but there's an extension where they can actually continue to get additional monies from, from the federal government. Uh, and so by the 14th month, you're supposed to have a trial for permanency. And that trial is that uh, reasonable efforts were made to reunify the child. And uh, social services said it failed. The parents failed. They were not able to put the child back into the, into the family household. That's a Minnesota State Statute 260C.301, Subdivision 8. Um, if it's uh, ICWA for, for Native Americans, uh, that's uh, 25 USC 1912D. That's active efforts to prevent the breakup of an Indian family because Lord knows they've been doing that uh, since uh, the pilgrims landed at Plymouth Rock. Um, anyway, I won't make a comment on that because it won't, it won't be positive what I'm going to say. So <laughs> we'll keep this positive. Um, so... At the time that they're trying to do a TPR, you are, in fact, do another, another trial. And a lot of people are not aware of this. So they don't just terminate your parental rights. They have to give you another trial, another admit to deny hearing. And actually, it's a lot tougher to terminate your parental rights than it is to put your child in foster care. Most people are not, are not aware of that. Um, so uh, truly focus on... Uh, your TPR. If you don't have a lawyer uh, for the uh, parts of the trial that are, that are leading up to the termination of parental rights, you should definitely make sure you, you have a lawyer uh, for your TPR because the standard is so high that the reason so many parents, you know, have a termination of parental rights is because they don't have a lawyer and they're not fully aware of <clears throat> the high bar that's required. I mean, you have to set a bar that says this parent will, will be unfit for the rest of their life and they'll never ever be a good parent. Well, that's really hard to, to, uh, to prove that, that a person will not change and that a parent will, will always be, it's called palatably unfit, meaning never fit. So, you know, if you have a person who's been uh, a drug addict, hardcore heroin for 14 months, and they, they neglect the child, they're strung out, they're looking horrible. Well, even that person can change, but you know, they have a hard time, but they have to show that they've made progress. They're, they're going to church, they're, they're, they're in rehabilitation programs, they're back to work, they, they have an apartment, you know, even if it's a small studio, but they're making efforts. So that's why I said it's really, really difficult. Most parents don't realize 
if they've TPR'd you, they've either done, either you're really palatably unfit or, you know, you, you've been railroaded, which I, I, I almost was TPR'd. So I know when I say you've been railroaded and you can be railroaded, you can be. But I didn't know what the bar was. You know, I just knew when they were talking about doing it to me, that's when I got rid of my attorney. I said, okay, it's time to go to town. Sorry, <clears throat> I digress. Um, but in, in essence, I, I did go to town and I, and, I, and I fought back on my own and I, and I got my children back. But, you know, it was, it was a lot of education and a lot of reading. And I had to really understand the law and what it is they were trying to do and what it is they were trying to prove. And then I had to present the evidence that, was, that contradicted or canceled out what, what, what they were doing. And I was able to do that. So that's what I'm giving you. So when I'm giving you the state statutes, you know, print out the handout, use these handouts. And if I have templates, use the templates, you know, not verbatim, but as a guide to what you need to do. Because see, everybody's case is different. There's no two cases that are the same. I wish I could say that something was textbooks. And if you do one, two, three, four, five, it'll work out perfectly for you. Uh, that is not always the case. And the reason it's not the case is because you got, you know, two variables that are always going to be different. A, the person who is being charged, and B, the social worker. You know, so you got two dynamics, you know, working, and things are happening at different times. So it's just something to, to, to keep in mind. So by month 12, as I was saying, um, the agency has to give a compelling reason for the continuance of that child in foster care and why that child cannot go home. And two, that there's no permanency disposition that's in the best interest of the child. And that permanent disposition can be going to live with a grandparent, going to live with an aunt, an uncle, or a cousin. There's, there's a number of things. You, you'll just have to look at that. But that's what they're trying to say. And that's, that's the Minnesota State Statute 260C.151, subdivision 5. So that's what they have to look at at month 12 to try and determine whether or not that child can remain in foster care. Um, you know, with some of my education, I, I truly believe that most of the parents who look at this will be getting their children back much faster once they understand what needs to be done and the dynamics surrounding it. So court findings uh, is the next thing we're going to talk about that as it relates to the Title IV funding. And so um, there has to be orders for, for periodic review after the child comes into state guardianship. And it's in the, the, the uh, permanent custody uh, section of the agency, <clears throat> and also if the child is over 18 years of age. So there needs to be a review hearing every 90 days to um, uh, determine whether or not that child still needs to remain in custody. And I, I tell a lot of parents, make sure you have a notebook, make sure you're keeping track of everything, every visit you go to, every UA you take, you know, if a UA comes back um, negative, immediately go to an independent hospital and have another UA done immediately. To, and, you know, and if that comes back positive, go to another hospital and have another one. So then your two positives from two different establishments will cancel out that one UA that you had that, uh, that came up positive, if it comes up positive. I'm just giving you, uh, you know, one example of, of what you need to do. So, and that they're looking for in these review hearings, that you're complying with your case plan because now you've been ordered, you're past your 60-day trial, so now you've been ordered to do your case plan, and they're trying to say that you're not complying, you're complying. Well, if you have a notebook and you have every visitation you do, every council you go to, everything you do, and then you have everyone sign off, I was here today, sign my book. I was here today, sign my book. Then that way... There's no way CPS can come in and say that you were not fulfilling your case plan and then you did not do what you were supposed to do in a 90-day period. Then they can say, oh, well, it was discretionary or she can fake it. Well, that's your opinion. Facts are facts. Here are the facts. Here's what the doctor said. These are the facts. So, you know, allegations and facts are, are, are two different things. So please keep that in mind in these reviews. Uh, there must be one permanent custody review annually. So at that first year, you know, the judge has to you know, look at the case and 
ensure by looking at the documentation and listening to the parents and what needs to be said that reasonable efforts have been made <clears throat> to finalize the, the permanency of that child, which means the agency tried to put the, the child back into the household and could not. The agency tried to put the child with the grandparent, an aunt, or an uncle and, and could not. Or the agency is, is planning uh, some sort of independent living if, if the child is, is of age like 18 or just about to be 18. So, you know, the foster care, you know, with that child who is 18 can be supervised or unsupervised. But, you know, once the child hits 18 years of age and if they're still in foster care, there has to be a compelling reason because that child is now an adult. So if the child is an indigent of the state or is incapable of taking care of themselves, well, then they can remain in foster care uh, past their 18th birthday. But here again, the agency has to, to find, uh, <clears throat> the agency has to be making reasonable efforts to finalize the permanency for that child at, at, when that child is 18. So, um, Please keep that in mind also. Um, that's really all I needed to say today as it relates to the Title IV funding. This was not a long episode. It was only about 30 minutes. Um, please, you know, look at our, our next session. Um, we're going to have about 20 in total, so that there's maybe even more. You know, right now I have 20 slated. There, there, there are actually more than 20 I can give. I'm going to see... Uh, the response that, that I received from everyone, and if it's a positive response, then I'll, I'll keep doing more. Thank you very much, and good luck with your case. Have a great day.